fiction, fantasy. More than a hundred movies have been made celebrating the prowess of the Mounties. Can you remember the first time you ever saw any Mounties? Yeah. Whereabouts? Gordon. What did you think about it? Well, I thought there's a, a hell of a thing. <laughs> you know? Ellis Henry is a farmer near Whiskey Gap, Alberta. He's one of a handful of people still alive who were out on the plains in the days when the legends of the Mounties were still being born. And he remembers not fictional heroes, but men of flesh and blood. And them boots and them spurs. You know, I used to laugh when they'd go to a dance and still have their spurs on, you know, at the dance. <laughs> That, that red coat, you know, if they're after a, a desperado, you know, that there's the damnedest best giveaway there is. You can see them for 10 miles, you know. <laughs> the Northwest Mounted Police, they were called at first. Northwest, because their forts were 80 years ago, lonely outposts in the Northwest Territories. They were mounted because the horse was then the only swift transport for a handful of men who had to police an area almost as big as Western Europe. And they were police because white settlers had already begun to move into the great lone land. And some kind of peace had to be established between the 30,000 Indians who reigned there and the white man who was on his way. Now, of that era, few traces remain. But what does remain? A few old buildings and the names of places like Standoff, Whoop Up, Slide Out, Whiskey Gap, hint at the reality out of which the legend of the Old West grew. South of the border, in the American West, it was often a very ugly reality which newspaper artists of the time sketched in the days before the news camera. As the white man advanced into the American West, there were continual quarrels which sometimes erupted into bloody massacres. In the struggle between white and Indian, it is officially acknowledged that the whites were usually at fault. Indeed, on the frontier, there were those who didn't think of the Indian as a human being, but as something to be exterminated. The plight of the Indians aroused violent indignation among civilized Americans, but public opinion was divided there were those who could point to the evidence of fierce retaliation on the white man wrought by the enraged Indians. But arrows didn't stop the flow of settlement moving in from the east. Most of them were courageous and honest folk, but they had been preceded by a different sort. Parasites who traded small amounts of whiskey for enormous piles of buffalo robes. What authorities there were attempted sporadically to suppress the whiskey trade but already the spirit of a proud people had been broken. Canadian Indians also became victims of whiskey traders who pushed north of the border. And in Canada too, the stage was set for tragedy. But one element was different. 
In 1873, an order in council established the Northwest Mounted Police. And the following summer, a strange expedition headed west. The party even included an artist to portray their progress. Ahead of them lay a journey of 800 miles, and they had a deadline to meet. They must reach Fort Whoopup, the whiskey trader's post where Lethbridge now stands, before the snow fell. It was a rough journey. They were buffeted by tornadoes, chewed by mosquitoes. They even got lost occasionally. But the long journey reached its end. Above the forts that they erected, they flew the flag which proclaimed that henceforth the Queen's law would prevail. These 250 men of the force were an interesting collection. They'd been assembled in Toronto, but among them were men from Ireland, France, Jamaica, Bohemia. Some, it was rumored, were remittance men. Some, like the son of the novelist Charles Dickens, were romantic adventurers. One man who was a scout with the Mounties in 1878 is still living. I was on, I'd come on, back on patrol and I stopped my horse, threw myself down on the grass while my horse is feeding. And I got up and the first thing I knew Something was just whisked by in my ear. Looked around, I couldn't see nothing. I was starting to walk, another one came. So I dropped down. You think it was Indians? Oh, yes, there was no other, no other person. They was arrows, you see. Harry Walden of Brandon, Manitoba, was 103 years old when interviewed. I didn't know I he left England as a boy of 16. He headed for the Wild West and became a scout at Wood Mountain Fort in Saskatchewan at the age of 20. He bears the scars of arrows to this day. I got one up here. He went through there. Do you want to see them? See? They went right in there, you feel that. And the other one, was turned out to be the worst one. And I was treating it like this. You see it there? There's the late one there. See it? Yes. And I waited a while, and the first thing I know, there were three or four shots come. So I jumped from my horse, gave the call, and he come on and I run off. Went down about a mile and a quarter, the nice spring creek. And I bathed both wounds, wrapped them up, and I began to feel sick, so I laid alongside the creek. I got back to camp the next day, towards evening. Though the white man's diseases were already beginning to take their toll, the Indians that Walden had to deal with were still a fiercely tough breed. I witnessed the brave dance, that is, similar to the war dance. Only they don't go through the war costume, but they initiate their braves. And I'll tell you, you've got to have nerve and courage to put the torture without showing the flint. It was a barbaric, brutal. They'd cut your face, cut your breast, and everything else. Blood was flying and give you. And then you'd have to run through the arrows. They'd shoot arrows. I said, you'd run and dodge them. That proved that you wasn't afraid. You knew they were going to do it, and you had to go up there. Well, you had to run. Well, uh, you're a good runner if you could run it, and you're a good scout if you can go through that. You got your war, what they call a brave. 
that's the high, high order in that, amongst the Indians, to be a warrior, you see. So, but that was barbaric. But when you come to size it up as I can now, those times was, was natural. It was their way of living, their way of finding out who you are and what you are. So that you've got to give them credit for what they've done. The late 70s were years of grave crisis. Encamped in the Cypress Hills of southern Saskatchewan were thousands of Sioux fled from the United States. The Indians in refuge here had struck back at the Americans. Among them were those who had butchered Custer's army to the last man at the Little Bighorn. Now in Canada, under Chief Sitting Bull, these proud and hate-filled men had a dream. It was a warrior's dream. They cherished the wild hope that they might rally the Canadian Indians to their cause and win a final and total vengeance south of the border. In Canada, the Sioux met white men the like of whom they hadn't encountered before. These men said to them, this is the law. It applies to all equally, white or Indian. These men said, this is a promise. We will keep our word. Zach Wood, one of these old timers, had a son who later became head of the force. He remembers being frightened of Indians as a youngster. There's certain early impressions one gets in childhood, and my trouble was to get in or out of the house without uh, run counter to one of these Indians letting a yell at me, yeah, which was enough to scare me back in the house and under the bed. Commissioner Wood, now retired, spends his summers at Fort Walsh. The fort was named after Superintendent Walsh, the man who had to face up to Sitting Bull and his Sioux warriors. Two Sioux took a lot of convincing because no white man had ever entered their camp and lived to tell the tale for many years. Such was the intense feeling against all whites. Consequently, when Walsh uh, almost forced his way into the camp and uh, laid down the law of how they were to conduct themselves while in Canada, their subsequent good behavior speaks for, the, for itself in that they followed out Walsh's instructions to the letter. The Canadian West was to see only one brief Indian uprising, though the peace at times was an uneasy one. The Second Riel Rebellion lay ahead. Whites of all sorts were moving in. Horse thieves and whiskey traders had to be tracked down. But it's remarkable how quickly the men who enforced the Queen's law won the wholesome respect of Indian and white alike. The legends that grew were about the men in scarlet, not the outlaws. What should have developed into a Wild West on the Canadian side was stopped in his tracks. The Wild West of legend did indeed exist, south of the border. Long after the Indians had been tucked away on reservations, General lawlessness marked the era of the cowboy, which followed. A lot of it was just high spirits. If a dude from the east swaggered down the main street, he was asking to be roughed up. Rough games for rough times. Almost every man carried a gun and kept in practice with sporting events that would be frowned on today. But it wasn't all fun by any means. If you resisted, you would be murdered. If they couldn't find out from you where your money was hidden, 
They might try ordeal by fire until you did tell. Law enforcement was often so weak that ordinary citizens took the law into their own hands. But it was lynch law. Without his case coming near a court to be judged fairly, a man could be condemned and strung up. Rough justice at the best, and perhaps not justice at all. young man, I was got an appointment as deputy sheriff in a little town in Montana, which shall be nameless. They was quite a rough bunch there, and they used to come in and shoot the town up once in a while, and, and uh, were really hoodlums. And they wanted to stop, and uh, I just happened to be handy, and they asked me to take it over, and they gave me a little bonus if I would. <clears throat> of course, most American sheriffs were honest men doing the best they could. But some, like John Bonneman of White Sulphur Springs, Montana, didn't last long as sheriff because of the citizens themselves. Well, they, uh, there was two of the leading merchants had general stores that were behind it, uh, strong. So they Bonneman's first day on duty as sheriff was a quiet one. He arrested only one man, a cowboy who'd got drunk and was charging up and down the main street, firing off six shooters at random in the traditional Western fashion. And uh, they fined him $50. <clears throat> and he didn't have any money, oh, a dollar or two maybe, and so they just put him in jail. And the next day, uh, it was the same story, pretty near. They come in there and just got drunk and was tearing around, and, and I took two more down. And uh, the third day, I think I got three. And uh, they never offered any resistance. I didn't have any trouble. They didn't offer to shoot at me, and <laughs> I didn't want to shoot them. So uh, the third day, though, the old fellow that uh, justice of peace down in this town he uh, he told me, he says, uh, you're going pretty strong on this. He said, uh, uh, first thing you know, we won't have no jail room at all. I went back up, and uh, uh, one of the uh, men that, a man that owned the biggest general store there, I won't name him because of some of his descendants is there yet, and he said, uh, uh, you're, I, I don't like you, you're carrying things too far. Uh, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, uh, you're driving trade away from town. He said, uh, lots of fellows, they won't come in here because they can't have a good time. And he said, uh, we're losing a lot of trade. Of course, there was four or five of them saloon keepers there, and, and uh, they all was pretty radical about it, and <laughs> they, they talked pretty sharp to me about it. And I said, well, you fellas, uh, when you held your meeting, I said, you got me down there and told me what you wanted. And, and I said, I really didn't want a darn job. And I said, I don't want it at all now. And I just pulled on, took the, my star off and threw it on the table and walked out. And that's the last, the last I ever acted as a lawman. The Wild West was only a moment in history. With the ever-increasing number of settlers came order. In some long-settled places even, people who had pioneered years before were pulling up stakes and heading for the last frontier, a promised land. I started one, one morning, left home with my little suitcase. It was just about half a block I had to walk to take the wagon that I was going to go in. Mrs. Sarah Card of Cards in Alberta, now in her 90s, left her home in Utah in 1889 when she was 18. Her married sister, two years before, had journeyed to Canada with the first of the Mormon settlers and there she was to join her. I left my home, 
My brother followed me to the gate and tried to get me not to go. But I told him that I had promised my sister that I would go and live with her, and I was going to go. In the first few days, I felt all right because I thought I never dreamed how far I was go going and how long it was going to take me to go over that road. It was very hard going. I wondered sometime how we would ever get to the end of our journey. I would ask, how much farther is it? And they'd say, oh, don't look for the end yet. We've got a long ways to go yet. Part of the way, I drove my own team and cooked for five men. I had to sleep in the wagon alone, and they, the men slept in a tent. And one night, it, I heard such strange, such a strange noise. It just sounded like a baby crying a long ways off, and it just thrilled me like it just. I just lay there and sweat until at last I couldn't stand it any longer, and I called to the man, and I told them I could hear a baby crying somewhere. And they got up and and come to see and went towards the noise, and, and it was a panther. And it frightened me so that I, I couldn't sleep in the wagon alone anymore. So I just took my bed and went in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> when we got to the line, I remember how beautiful the country did look. It was nothing but just a wave of high grass. The grass was up to the up to the wagon box past. And I thought, well, how is it that there's no houses or no anything here? I could, just couldn't believe that we were coming to a place where there was no civilization at all. But we come on when we got to the line. We saw in a distance two persons walk, uh, riding on on lovely big horses. And as they come closer, we could see that there were men in red jackets and very nice little caps on their head. And our men talked to them and told them that we were coming as settlers and we expected to stay here. And uh, I'll never forget how <coughs> thrilled I was to know that they, they were the policemen, the mounted police, who uh, guarded the country. And I felt that they would be a protection to us. We drove into Cardston, and, and there were such a few houses that I, I just couldn't believe that that was the place where we were going to stop. And I thought, how long are we going to stay here? When I drove up to the, when they drove up to the house where my sister was, I asked her how long we were going to stay here. She said, this is going to be our home. So I never thought of anything else but what this is the place that I was going to stay. I had 10 children, 50 grandchildren, and 54 great-grandchildren, and three great-great-grandchildren. I have the five generations. Sometime I'm frightened to think of so many that I responsible for. <laughs> well, I'm afraid maybe that I haven't done my part as I should, but we can all see that, that we might have done better. Lethbridge now stands where old Fort Whoopup once stood. 
And to the younger generations, the Mounties are just cops doing a job. Only rarely are there echoes of the Old West. Over on the American side in Montana, John Bonneman and his cronies sometimes get together. And they talk of the days when a man had to be quick on the draw. And they talk sometimes of their counterparts who brought law and order to the Canadian West. It was a Montana newspaper of long ago, the Fort Benton Record, that said, those mounted police don't scare worth a cent. <laughs> 